The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau Published in 1762 Translated by G. D. H. Cole Book One Subject of the First Book Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks himself the master of others, and still remains a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? That question I think I can answer. If I took into account only force, and the effects derived from it, I should say, as long as a people is compelled to obey, and obeys, it does well. As soon as it can shake off the yoke, and shakes it off, it does still better. For regaining its liberty by the same right as took it away, either it is justified in resuming it, or there was no justification for those who took it away. But the social order is a sacred right which is the basis of all other rights. Nevertheless, this right does not come from nature, and must therefore be founded on conventions. THE RIGHT OF THE STRONGEST the strongest is never strong enough to be always the master, unless he transforms strength into right and obedience into duty. Hence the right of the strongest, which, though to all seeming meant ironically, is really laid down as a fundamental principle. But are we never to have an explanation of this phrase? Force is a physical power, and I fail to see what moral effect it can have. To yield to force is an act of necessity, not of will at the most, an act of prudence. In what sense can it be a duty? Suppose for a moment that this so-called right exists. I maintain that the sole result is a mass of inexplicable nonsense, for if force creates right, the effect changes with the cause. Every force that is greater than the first succeeds to its right. As soon as it is possible to disobey with impunity, disobedience is legitimate and the strongest being always in the right, the only thing that matters is to act so as to become the strongest. But what kind of right is that which perishes when force fails? If we must obey per force, there is no need to obey because we ought, and if we are not forced to obey, we are under no obligation to do so. Clearly the word right adds nothing to force. In this connection it means absolutely nothing. Obey the powers that be. If this means yield to force, it is a good precept, but superfluous. I can answer for its never being violated. All power comes from God, I admit. But so does all sickness. Does that mean that we are forbidden to call in the doctor? A brigand surprises me at the edge of a wood. Must I not merely surrender my purse on compulsion? But even if I could withhold it, am I in conscience bound to give it up? For certainly the pistol he holds is also a power. Let us then admit that force does not create right, and that we are obliged to obey only legitimate powers. THE SOCIAL COMPACT I suppose men to have reached the point at which the obstacles in the way of their preservation in the state of nature show their power of resistance to be greater than the resources at the disposal of each individual for his maintenance in that state. That primitive condition can then subsist no longer and the human race could perish unless it changed its manner of existence. But as men cannot engender new forces, but only unite and direct existing ones, they have no other means of preserving themselves than the formation, by aggregation, of a sum of forces great enough to overcome the resistance. These they have to bring into play by means of a single motive power, and cause to act in concert. This sum of forces can arise only where several persons come together. But as the force and liberty of each man are the chief instruments of his self-preservation, how can he pledge them without harming his own interests, and neglecting the care he owes to himself? This difficulty, in its bearing on my present subject, may be stated in the following terms. The problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect with the whole common force the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. This is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution. The clauses of this contract are so determined by the nature of the act that the slightest modification would make them vain and ineffective, so that although they have perhaps never been formally set forth, they are everywhere the same and everywhere tacitly admitted and recognized.
until on the violation of the social compact each regains his original rights and resumes his natural liberty while losing the conventional liberty in favor of which he renounced it. These clauses, properly understood, may be reduced to one, the total alienation of each associate, together with all his rights to the whole community. For in the first place, as each gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all, and this being so, no one has any interest in making them burdensome to others. Moreover, the alienation being without reserve, the union is as perfect as it can be, and no associate has anything more to demand. For, if the individuals retain certain rights, as there would be no common superior to decide between them and the public, each, being on one point his own judge, would ask to be so on all. The state of nature would thus continue, and the association would necessarily become inoperative or tyrannical. Finally, each man in giving himself to all gives himself to nobody, and as there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same right as he yields others over himself, he gains an equivalent for everything he loses, and an increase of force for the preservation of what he has. If then we discard from the social compact what is not of its essence, we shall find that it reduces itself to the following terms. Each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will, and... In our corporate capacity, we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. At once, in place of the individual personality of each contracting party, this act of association creates a moral and collective body, composed of as many members as the assembly contains votes, and receiving from this act its unity, its common identity, its life, and its will. This public person, so formed by the union of all other persons, formerly took the name of city, and now takes that of republic or body politic. It is called by its members state when passive, sovereign when active, and power when compared with others like itself. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of people, and severally are called citizens, as sharing in the sovereign power, and subjects as being under the laws of the state. But these terms are often confused and taken one for another, it is enough to know how to distinguish them when they are being used with precision. The Sovereign This formula shows us that the act of association comprises a mutual undertaking between the public and the individuals, and that each individual in making a contract, as we may say with himself, is bound in a double capacity. As a member of the sovereign, he is bound to the individuals, and as a member of the state, to the sovereign. But the maxim of civil right that no one is bound by undertakings made to himself does not apply in this case, for there is a great difference between incurring an obligation to yourself and incurring one to a whole of which you form a part. Attention must further be called to the fact that public deliberation, while competent to bind all subjects to the sovereign, because of the two different capacities in which each of them may be regarded, cannot, for the opposite reason, bind the sovereign to itself and that it is consequently against the nature of the body politic for the sovereign to impose on itself a law which it cannot infringe. Being able to regard itself in only one capacity, it is in the position of an individual who makes a contract with himself, and this makes it clear that there neither is nor can be any kind of fundamental law binding on the body of the people, not even the social contract itself. This does not mean that the body politic cannot enter into undertakings with others, provided the contract is not infringed by them, for in relation to what is external to it, it becomes a simple being, an individual. But the body politic, or the sovereign, drawing its being wholly from the sanctity of the contract, can never bind itself, even to an outsider, to do anything derogatory to the original act. For instance, to alienate any part of itself, or to submit to another sovereign. Violation of the act by which it exists would be self-annihilation, and that which is itself nothing can create nothing. As soon as this multitude is so united in one body, it is impossible to offend against one of the members without attacking the body, and still more to offend against the body without the members resenting it. Duty and interest, therefore, equally oblige the two contracting parties to give each other help, and the same men should seek to combine in their double capacity all the advantages dependent upon that capacity. Again, the sovereign, being formed wholly of the individuals who compose it, neither has nor can have any interest contrary to theirs, and consequently the sovereign power need give no guarantee to its subjects, 
because it is impossible for the body to wish to hurt all its members. We shall also see later on that it cannot hurt any in particular. The sovereign, merely by virtue of what it is, is always what it should be. This, however, is not the case with the relation of the subjects to the sovereign, which, despite the common interest, would have no security that they would fulfill their undertakings unless it found means to assure itself of their fidelity. In fact, each individual, as a man, may have a particular will contrary or dissimilar to the general will which he has as a citizen. His particular interest may speak to him quite differently from the common interest. His absolute and naturally independent existence may make him look upon what he owes to the common cause as a gratuitous contribution, the loss of which will do less harm to others than the payment of it is burdensome to himself. And regarding the moral person which constitutes the state as a persona ficta, because not a man, he may wish to enjoy the rights of citizenship without being ready to fulfill the duties of a subject. The continuance of such an injustice could not but prove the undoing of the body politic. In order, then, that the social compact may not be an empty formula, it tacitly includes the undertaking, which alone can give force to the rest, that whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than that he will be forced to be free, for this is the condition which, by giving each citizen to his country, secures him against all personal dependence. In this lies the key to the working of the political machine. This alone legitimizes civil undertakings, which, without it, would be absurd, tyrannical, and liable to the most frightful abuses. The Civil State The passage from the state of nature to the civil state produces a very remarkable change in man, by substituting justice for instinct in his conduct, and giving his actions the morality they had formerly lacked. Then, only when the voices of duty take the place of physical impulses and the right of appetite, does man, who so far had considered only himself, find that he is forced to act on different principles, and to consult his reason before listening to his inclinations. Although in this state he deprives himself of some advantages which he got from nature, he gains in return others so great, his faculties are so stimulated and developed, his ideas so extended, his feelings so ennobled, and his whole soul so uplifted, that did not the abuses of this new condition often degrade him below that which he left, he would be bound to bless continually the happy moment which took him from it forever, and instead of a stupid and unimaginative animal, made him an intelligent being and a man. Let us draw up the whole account in terms easily commensurable. What man loses by the social contract is his natural liberty and an unlimited right to everything he tries to get and succeeds in getting. What he gains is civil liberty and the proprietorship of all he possesses. If we are to avoid mistake in weighing one against the other, we must clearly distinguish natural liberty, which is bounded only by the strength of the individual, from civil liberty, which is limited by the general will, and possession, which is merely the effect of force or the right of the first occupier, from property, which can be founded only on a positive title. We might, over and above all this, add to what man acquires in the civil state, moral liberty, which alone makes him truly master of himself. For the mere impulse of appetite is slavery, while obedience to a law which we prescribe to ourselves is liberty.